Hello everyone and welcome to today's Softree webinar. Um, just a key piece of a housekeeping that I need to tell you. Um, please ask questions and engage with us through the Q&A uh, section of the GoToWebinar panel. We can address all the questions at the end of the webinar. Okay, so what do we have for today's agenda? Um, so very quickly, I'm going to do a bit of introduction on LiDAR. And then Dave Mills, um, our presenter, will take over and showcase um, his uh, example project that he prepared for today's webinar. Um, so the data that we're going to be demonstrating today is forestry specific, but the concepts can apply to any sort of rural road project. They will likely mention this too, but our optimization module or add-on, Softree Optimal, works phenomenally well with LiDAR and can speed up your design process. And on to the next slide. Okay, I uh, want to be really quick about this slide since um, I'm assuming that most of you know what LiDAR already is. So LiDAR is basically a high resolution survey collector. LiDAR has been steadily growing in popularity um, and use across all the industry that soft, soft, industries where Softree works with. So to adapt, we have been developing and focusing on our Softree development that keeps easy to use and fast to work with your LiDAR. The LiDAR datasets are typically packaged in tiles and the full data set can be enormous. This is why um, we believe um, a typical workflow is very, an efficient workflow is very important and to be streamlined. On to the next, one, uh, next slide here. Okay, um, so the typical, so this is just, uh, from top to bottom, the typical workflow starts with first creating and importing an area of interest such as a GPS track which they will um, which will be a part of Dave's presentation today, or a polygon of interest. Import your LiDAR into our terrain module. Um, you, can thin, uh, in, uh, you can thin on import, uh, create, create a digital terrain model, and uh, re-import and re-thin the data to, um, pro to get more accurate results. And uh, post-import thinning options uh, is very optional. Although um, thinning may not even required for small enough projects. And then you can move on to your, the location module to start your role design. Okay, um, so the benefits of LiDAR. Uh, traditionally, survey methods only collect topo data in preliminary phases and features um, what the survey deem worthwhile. But on the other hand, LiDAR often collects several ground points in square meters and reduces the interpolation between widely spaced points and the likelihood of notable features being missed. The biggest advantage from a road edge perspective is that we can explore multiple design options without having to resurvey all over again. And without further ado, I will now pass it over to Dave. Thanks very much, Andy. So let's get my screen on the screen. Right, so you should be looking at my terrain module here. We've got some 3D data. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to um, reread this data and and show you how I how I got it from LiDAR, uh, and then I'm going to bring in one of these tracks. Um, we've got one on the screen already. I'm going to I'm going to bring in another one. Okay, so starting from scratch, here we have an, an empty terrain. Now this is not ideal because first of all we don't have any area of interest, and secondly. Um, we don't have a, um, a projection defined. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly open a file that has some, um, well, here's one that has an image in it. That's That's got a well-defined area of interest. Let's look at that. Okay, so here's my image. We got this using our um, LiveMaps import. And you can see an existing 
road, some openings, and this is clearly about logging. However, uh, hopefully the concepts will apply to other things. Now, this one, I did set up a projection. So we're in working in BC Bears projection, we're in metric units. Now I can look at this and say, you know, the area I'm interested in is around here. So let's draw a polygon. Um, hopefully I'm going to get it right. You know, just, just to be sure I get it right, I'm going to actually bring in my GPS track here too. So let's do that. So I've got a G couple of GPS tracks. And working with LiDAR doesn't really provide um, information about what's on the ground. It, it's very good at picking up the elevation of the ground, but it's not going to tell you what it's made out of, whether it's gravelly or muddy, uh, solid rock or glacial till. So you're probably going to have to walk around in the field at least um, once to do some um, reconnaissance. That will generate tracks. Um, you've got a GPS with you. You can generate a track of where you've walked. And in fact, you can keep track of um, features that you find by entering comments in your track. Now, these tracks were generated, um, I have to admit, uh, not by me walking around in the field. So there we are. Um, so these tracks don't have any comments on them or other attributes but they could. Now this is my area of interest. I could use these things to generate um, a corridor where I bring in information near the features or, and that's what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to create a polygon. I'm going to call it AOI for area of interest. I don't care about elevations on this um, polygon. And I'm going to draw it with the mouse. Uh, and I'm going to use a little trick in the feature section here to just make that into a perfect rectangle. Okay, there's my area of interest. Now I can bring in my LiDAR data. So uh, just to make things a little simpler here, I'm going to save this without the image. Okay, there. I still got my image file. I can put it in the background if I want. That's how we recommend that you use images in our software. Just add them to the background. So there's the image file. However, I don't need it for now. Let's bring in the LiDAR data and let's keep it inside this box and throw away the rest. I'm going to use insert file. That allows me to add multiple LiDAR um, tiles. So there's a lot of tiles in general for a LiDAR survey. And I'm not seeing any here. They would probably be in here. There we go. There's two LiDAR tiles, LAS files. I don't know which one is in my area of interest, so I'll just select them both. Now, if I click OK here, it's just going to read them all in. Um, what I'll do instead is I'll add an area of interest, polygon, select it. So it's very important that I have the, um, the feature in my terrain before I do this insert file. Otherwise, I can't use it to thin the, uh, the LiDAR data. So you can't start from an empty terrain. If you want to use a polygon for thinning, you have to have the polygon created and it has to be in the same um, coordinate system as your as your LiDAR data. Uh, okay, um, I've created, whoops, I didn't double click on that. There we go. I've created the area of interest polygon. It's now a region. So I have two, the default region and the polygon, and I'm gonna turn the default region off. No features, skip all. In the area of interest, I'm gonna read them all in. If you had a really large data set, you might want to thin it down just to see how many points you're going to get. I know for um, from experience this is going to read in and it'll be quite small. 
Okay, let's get that started. Um, LIDAR LAS files generally don't have a projection associated with them. If I knew the projection of my LIDAR data, I could change it here and convert it to my current working projection. In fact, they're the same, so I don't need to do anything. I can ignore this message about uh, undefined projection and read my data. Now there's about 3 million points in the uh, in the two LiDAR tiles. There we go. And as you can see, it's read the data inside of the rectangle and no and nowhere else. Let's just stop drawing. We don't need to see all those points. Um, and there's the two LiDAR tiles, one here, one there. I don't need those. I probably should have turned that off. Um, and here's the data set that I've got. Now there's there's um, 500,000 points, which is certainly not a problem. I can I can make a surface out of that. Um, it's certainly not going to overload uh, the terrain module. It can handle up to 10 million, no problem. However, just to show you the post-process thinning, let's take a look at this data a little closer. So there's all the data points. Now you'll notice that there are some um, areas where the points are a bit sparse, and then there are other areas where they're very dense. And uh, if we're lucky, we'll find a roadway. There's one. So that is a is a um, open area. The lidar is very dense in that zone. And uh, now I would like to thin out the excess points that I don't need. So I'm going to use our um, terrain modeling simplify tool to reduce the number of points to one per square meter no more. So what this does is it makes a grid over the area and if there's more than one point in a grid cell it removes all but one of them. So it it won't help you in the areas where the data is sparse but in the dense areas it will remove points that are roughly a meter apart from each other or less than a meter apart. Okay let's do that that's easy. And the data now looks like this. So you can you can see that dense area where the road was is not so dense. The number of points went from half a million down to 0.34 million. Didn't change very much. And um, we've we've got a data set now that's pretty decent. I'm going to build a surface from that. Um, my track points were 3D, so they got they got disconnected. There they are. Um, I don't need those points anyway. I'm going to do that later. So let's um, make a surface. Probably seen this lots of times. We just have to choose uh, major and minor spacing. And we also need to, to uh, make sure the start station is, is reasonable. So, or start elevation, sorry. So that um, we get even numbers. And I'm going to turn off labeling. I don't need labels right now build a surface. There we go. Look at it in 3D. And there we are. Now the beauty of LiDAR is that um, often you can see things that you can't in an air photo. Like for example, there's, a, there's an existing road right there. And you'll see that one of my tracks is actually pretty close to that. I probably should have lain right on top of it. Um, but when I made the track, I I, <laughs> I wasn't paying full attention. Um, okay, so that's a, a decent workflow for bringing in LiDAR data. Um, let's go to the next step, which is to generate a, um, a pair of roads, in this case, that are near some, some GPS tracks. So let's, let's imagine a situation where... Um, we send a surveyor out with a GPS unit. He follows what he thinks is a good route for a road, and he comes back to the office with a track, and the track is tagged with, with information about what he's found along the route. Um, 
he may have been directed by um, an alignment that was created before he even went to the field. This is something I'm not going to show you, but it would be quite reasonable for me to design a road here um, using the location module and, and various pegging options to find the alignment and then give that to the, um, the surveyor in a, in a format that he can take into the field and he can follow it perhaps using Avenza Maps uh, and his GPS unit and pick up more information and a track of where he actually went. Okay, so I've got the track. I want to see it on here. Let's just tile so we can see the plan and the profile, uh, plan and the 3D, sorry. Let's bring in my track. Now, I, I've got the track in a GPX format. I can use uh, file open to get that. So GPX is a uh, import format that does that is exported from GPS handhelds. You may also get the information as a KMZ file, um, and we can read lots of other formats too. And you can just drag and drop it too. I mean, if you've got the thing in a folder, here's my GPS track folder. I can just say, oh yeah, there's my two tracks. Let's just drag them in. I'm going to do one at a time, actually. Let's do uh, track number one. Okay, uh, GPS tracks are in 3D, or not 3D, sorry, they're in 2D lat long format. And we need to convert them to our coordinate system. So yes, I want to convert, apply transformation, and there it is. Now this track came in with a um, a polyline. That doesn't always happen. I've seen tracks that don't have a polyline associated with them. They're just a bunch of points. In fact, if I look now in my selected features, down at the bottom where the tracks are, you can see that there's a whole bunch of new features that are all selected. I just inserted them called track points. There's 19 of those. And then there's one called tracks at the end here, um, which is the um, connected polyline feature. So I'm going to deselect that. Um, these points come in selected. And if you want to make them into a polyline, you can join them. OK, now I'm. I'm going to join them now, and then I'm going to delete the other track. That's kind of a trick that uh, just to make the thing work as if. There it is. That's the tracks feature. Let's delete that. Um, and now let's just, just explode this. So if you had read in a GPS track that did not have a polyline in it, it would look like this. Almost invisible, it's just a bunch of points. There's one that's got a, um, a symbol on it, and the other ones are kind of hard to see. So the first thing I'm going to do, I've just imported my track so it's still selected. I'm going to put a symbol on it and apply that. There you go. Now you can see the separate track points. As you can see down here, there are 20 features selected. Um, and they have elevation zero. So the trick to getting the elevations in there without generating all these um, interpolated points is to set the track points to be draped, elevations off, modeled on, and apply that, and then set them back to be elevation features and apply that. Now they've picked up the elevation, but this is no longer a draped feature. What I forgot to do in my first iteration is click the apply button. Now I've done it and now I can join them. Great. Maybe we can just edit that first part out, right? Okay. So um, that feature is visible on the 3D model. It does kind of skip underground a little bit because only the points are on the ground. And I can now use that to generate 
a um, an alignment. And there's two ways to do that. The first way is to use the, the feature itself in the location module. And the second way, which has some advantages, is to export it as a, um, a P-Line feature. Now, I don't have any attributes associated with this um, surface because I, I generated it digitally. I didn't actually go out in the field and survey it. But if I did have attributes, um, I could display them in here. And I can do that with the, um, whoops, here, uh, options, add or move. And here's all the attributes from the track points. Um, and I can display them. And if there's any, yeah, track points. I don't think there's anything in there. Let's just take a look. So I'm going to, whoops, drag them over here. OK. Okay, there's all those attributes. There are some things in there. Um, for example, that's point ID number 19. And if I move through my points, you can see, oh, that's all the same. Oh, well, that's kind of boring. Okay. Um, anyway, if you had some descriptions in here, you could use those to create um, comments that would display on your field and we can display those comments uh, we can do that using the uh, assign function this allows you to take any attribute and copy it to any other attribute so for example you could take um, is this the target yeah you could copy an attribute into the comment and why is that not available? I set up the, oh, I didn't double click. There we go. That's my target. And Here's the value, and I can pick from any of the attributes that come out of my GPS track and stick it in my comment field. So, for example, I could I could put in the um, segment ID or the point ID, or hopefully there would be a comment in here. I'm not going to do that because I don't have any real data. What I will do instead is I'll just stick a comment on here, on track point on this track point here. I'm going to add a comment. Uh, there's several different ways to do that. I kind of like using the coordinates dialog box. It allows you to see where you are and type in a comment. So uh, what should I see here? How about solid rock? And what about on the next one? Um, we could put some comment up here. OK, in the saddle. So these are artificial labels, but they could have come from the GPS track. They will be visible in my plan window when I create my location design, um, but they could also be exported into a artificial traverse that is that has the same points as the track. Here's how you do that. We can save all kinds of different features from terrain, but this is the one I want to create, um, a survey file, TR1 file. I've already got one here called PLINE1, so let's call it, uh, in case I screw up, this will naturally pick up the XYZ coordinates of this feature only at the points that are defined, so there's only 19 of them. And I don't need side shots because I've already got side. I've already got surface information in LiDAR. Okay. Let's take a look at that file that I just created. So those of you who have used our software for a while should know all about creating an alignment from a um, a P-line traverse. 
this P-Line Traverse was created by me just now. And there's my comment. And there's my other comment. Um, don't need side shots. Ground type's not in there, but I could add it now if I wanted to. I can also do that later in the location module. Um, and these coordinates, or at least um, survey information here, was just calculated, back calculated from the coordinates. Great. So I've got a I've got a thing called a um, a P-line traverse, and now let's go to the location module and actually create a design. So I've got a LiDAR file. I don't need, uh, geez, I haven't saved it yet. Let's go back there and save it. And it's called AOI. Okay, so that's going to be my original ground. p Traverse is optional. You can actually work from a terrain. If I go to the next, uh, am I allowed to go back after that? I don't know. We'll see. If you go to the next thing here, you can actually pick a feature and it chooses the default, uh, the selected one by default. You can pick a feature from the list. And there's my track points feature as your initial alignment. And that will give you um, an alignment. If, however, and I can't go back, so let's start again. You, you define a P-line traverse, then you get the benefit of, well, first of all, it automatically um, uses that for the alignment, just like the feature, so no difference there. But then you also get the added benefit of having a reference line with reference stations uh, that remain in your, in your location design, P-line reference. Okay, there's my alignment. It's tracking the, uh, the, the traverse. Let's just put in a little um, switchback curve here just to illustrate what I mean by the, the P-line reference. So I'm just going to modify this a bit, put in a horizontal curve. This is a forest road. We think we can do about 20 meters radius. And I don't want a gap between my curves, so I'm just going to move this IP up until they touch. There we go. And there's my horizontal curve. So that black line is still there. It's the P line. And you would see the feature in the terrain background anyway. But the P line is special because it keeps track of um, stationing. And you can use it as a, as a reference. Uh, in addition, you can display the comments from the P line. There it is, solid rock. Um, that's that's just in the background, but um, I can actually display labels from my P line. Um, and those of you again familiar with force work should know this um, labels. There's a whole bunch of labels associated with the P line. One of them is the station number, the P line station and P station comments. So there there it is displayed. Oops. That's the station number. I didn't want that. Sorry. Turn that one off. Yeah, that's better. So that's the label coming from the P-line. That's the label in the background of the terrain. OK, um, that's how you get an alignment into location from a track. Um, 
as I mentioned, you can do the P-Line export, but it's not necessary. You can also just use the feature as your initial alignment. And uh, the other part we wanted to cover here was comparing alignments. I've gone a little over time due to my mistakes. And uh, I've got a couple of questions, so I'm going to answer those first in case you have to um, duck out because it's, it's uh, getting late. Question number one, do you have a PDF file um, for road design with LiDAR data? I think he's asking for some instructions. And first of all, this, this video will be up on the screen. Uh, pardon me, up in the web very shortly after it's been um, processed and maybe even edited. All of our previous webinars are up there as well. So um, if, you, if you're looking for help in a video form, just go to our web, our web page and you can search there. Uh, the other thing you can do, which I find uh, is, is really valuable, is, is not just searching in our web page, but just search Google search for um, soft tree YouTube and then your topic and you'll get lots of hits so there's a couple of videos um, yeah so for help search in here for our knowledge base and and there may well be a good page on this um, search in here you may find a good video and this one will be up later. Question of why I'd like to simplify using the simplify tool in um, the terrain module. The answer to that is usually you don't need to simplify unless you have way too many points. Now, I only have half a million points in here, even including all the, the contours. So this is, this is not really a, a problem for this for this particular um, model. I don't need to thin the data. What often happens, however, is you've got a long corridor and it cuts through a dozen or 25 tiles. And if you bring in all those tiles, you have way too many points. So you would, you would like to um, thin the data down to get down below that um, 10 million or 5 million points. Other, other than that, uh, there, there's really no point. In this data, however, we, we had data, if you recall um, from before, uh, that was really dense near a road. And it's just, it's just redundant information. So taking out those points makes it a little, uh, a little smaller, a little faster. Um, that's the only reason you would, you would do it in this case. Okay, um, I haven't covered the comparison between points, which is my, um, which is part of the topic in our description, and I, I will take a look at that right now. So, comparison between different alignments in the location module. Let me open an example. I'm going to open this one here that I prepared earlier. This is using the full LiDAR data set. And it works just fine. There's actually no need to have um, any thinning. The the data came in with well, I did thin it. I didn't I didn't uh, truncate it. I didn't chop it down to an area of interest. I just thinned out the points that I didn't need, and it's like a, one and a half million points, which is no problem at all for road and or terrain. Um, right now, comparison. So what do, what do we got here? We've actually got two completely different routes going around a hill. And um, it would be interesting to see which one is cheapest. Um, if we're trying to go from A to B, um, I should be able to compare those two. Now, um, I, I did use the optimizer to help me design these alignments. Um, the horizontal came from the track, and then I did some work. Like here, I put in a curve. And uh, on the other side, uh, I put in the curves 
here, and you can see it's different from the P line. Um, yeah, so I made I made a few modifications to the horizontal alignment, and then I designed the vertical. And I, I put in some curves. I actually used the optimizer to give me a head start, and then I put in a few curves, and then I made a few changes. And let's just update that. Um, so now I've got three horizontal alignments in here. And on this horizontal alignment, I think I got two verticals. Set current. Yeah. Um, so you can create multiple vertical alignments for a given horizontal, and you can create multiple horizontal alignments. One thing to note when you're working with multiple horizontal alignments, sometimes you have to manually um, recalculate. Whoops, wrong button. Sometimes you have to manually um, recalculate. To bring everything up to date, like for example, um, my mass hall here is not visible, so I'm going to recalculate all, and there it is. Uh, right. So here's here's the design. Um, this is vertical alignment number two for horizontal alignment number two, and these heavy um, points on here are just to help you see what's what. If I click on horizontal alignment number one, it jumps over to there. You can see clearly which is which. If you don't want to see those heavy um, uh, what is the current symbol, then you just click up here in the uh, Project Explorer or close the Project Explorer. You can also switch between alignments here. But comparison. Now, I've got two alignments, horizontal alignment 1, 1A, one uh, or 1B, they're very similar, and then horizontal alignment 2. Um, how could I compare them? Well, horizontal alignment 2, um, vertical alignment 2 is the current alignment. And if I select horizontal alignment one and then come down here and compare with current, it shows me the difference between the two. This one is grayed out because it's not it's not recalculated. So if I want to make sure it's up to date, I can recalculate all here. That recalculates all alignments, vertical and horizontal. So it'll take a little while. It didn't change. Um, so it did recalculate, but it didn't change the number. The number was correct. Um, and you can see that there's a very small difference between um, the selected horizontal alignment number one, that's this one, and the current horizontal alignment number two. Of course, costing requires that you, that you have reasonable values in your... Um, unit costs, but the ones that come with the software, and you can you can save these things in a little file called a, a GDX file, the ones that come with the software are reasonable. They may not be um, applicable to a particular area, but the, the one thing that you can say for sure is that if one alignment is cheaper than another, it doesn't really matter what the unit costs are. Um, the absolute value of the cost may not be accurate, but the comparison is at least telling you which one is cheaper. So it's saying that it's, and this is kind of um, an amazing coincidence that these are so close, uh, it's telling you that there's not much difference between these two. Alignment two is just as good as alignment one. Um, and you can do the same thing with verticals. So here I've got two vertical alignments, and you can easily create another vertical alignment, just right click new and it copies the current one, then you can modify it. Uh, same with the horizontal, you can create a new one, new here, and there's there's tools um, up here too. New vertical, new horizontal. Okay, so I've created a, um, a vertical alignment here and I modified it. How different is it to the original? Well, first of all, you can see the two. That one without the little magenta balls on it is the um, current one and 
that's the selected one. So V align one was much lower here, and V align two was higher. Um, and again, I can I can compare them just by looking down below. There's the current one. There's the selected one. And there is a, a again a small difference. Didn't make a lot of difference. Um, made a lot of difference to eh, not a lot. It made a bit of difference to the um, haul cost proportionally quite a large difference but in absolute value it's not a big number so yeah I reduced the haul cost a lot um, but that didn't make much difference be because the haul cost is such a small value in total Got no, one more question about computer specs um, LiDAR does take up RAM. If you're going to start working with, with models that have 10 million points in them, you probably need, uh, I'd say 8 gigabytes is a reasonable amount of RAM. Um, yeah, uh, not, a, not a huge amount. Um, things get slow. You can put in more data than, than 10 million points in our software, especially if you've, well, you better have the 64-bit the version. 32-bit has a very limited amount of memory. Um, so 64-bit software, sure, you can put in more points, but things start to get slow. Um, for example, in the, in the 3D window, um, oops, there we go. When I click and drag to rotate the window, it'll go really, really slow if you put in too many points. Uh, similarly, the plan view may take a while to update if it's got uh, too many points in the, in the contours, things like that. Okay, I think uh, that just about sums up what we wanted to cover for today. Um, we can answer questions offline. Thanks, everyone. Um, so there are a few more questions that we have to attend to, but uh, we know who you are, so we'll get to you um, after, uh, after this webinar. Good. Thanks so much for attending. The video will be posted probably tomorrow. Um, Sorry to keep you so long. It should have been only half an hour, and I think the video will be probably chopped down a little bit. We'll see you in a week or two when our next webinar comes up. Bye now. Bye now. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks for watching another SoftTree webinar. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel below or tell us that you liked the video. Thanks for watching.